Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from the comments on the videos posted on YouTube and Odyssey. Sometimes these questions and comments come through uh, Mastodon, Reddit, email. The very first question I want to respond to is, Hey DT, how's your AI integration progress in your Linux workflow? Now that's an interesting question because I'm not exactly sure what he wants here. The AI integration progress. Not sure what exactly that means, but I'm assuming he wants to know how I use AI in my day-to-day -day Linux workflow. Well, I don't. I, I mean, I like AI. I like playing with AI, but it's not a regular part of any sort of workflow. I do like playing with AI chat assistants. So occasionally I will ask a chat assistant like Leo in my Brave browser or Olama if I'm at a terminal or ChatGPT if I want to play with that particular chat assistant. You know, sometimes I will ask those chat assistance questions or I will have them do certain tasks for me but it's not a regular part of any workflow I don't regularly use any kind of AI generation like uh, audio generation video generation image generation I don't do anything with those sorts of tools at least not right now so none of it is a regular part of my Linux workflow the next question is hey DT as your videos are licensed as Creative Commons would it be okay if I use them to train a voice model for Piper dash TTS. So he's training a large language model or something. I'm not sure what he's doing here. He says, I'm working on a local voice assistant for Linux based on Olama, and it would be great if I could respond using your voice. I'm considering training a custom wake word for it, like Hey DT. Okay, so I see what he's doing. He's going to create this, you know, chat assistant, something like, I don't know, Siri on your, your Apple devices or whatever, instead of saying, hey, Siri, or on your Android phones, hey, Google, you know, to bring up the chat assistant. He's going to create one using my voice, and the wake word is going to be, Hey DT, right? That's kind of neat. I don't care if he does that or not. Uh, again, all of my uh, videos, all of the content I create on the DistroTube channel, and you know, it's all licensed under the Creative Commons license. I really don't care if you guys want to use any of my content, or in this case, use my voice. You're not going to get any complaints from me. Moving on to the next question. Uh, I think this is more related to my second channel, uh, the DT Options channel, rather than the Linux channel channel distro tube but he writes hey dt can you tell us what trading software is available on linux either on this channel or your other channel so he watches both channels and that's why he's interested in both linux and trading software and yes i do all of my stuff on linux including trading stocks and options and futures. I don't have a machine that runs Windows and I've never owned a Mac. Linux is the only operating system on any of my computers and that's been the case for going on 16, 17 years now. And yeah, that whole time that I've been on Linux, I've been trading and investing. So there's plenty of trading software as far as desktop applications designed for trading that run on Linux. The broker and the platform that I use is Tasty Trade. I've been on Tasty Trade for about the last five years now. Before that, I was a Thinkorswim user. I was a customer with Thinkorswim when it was owned by TD Ameritrade. Their desktop client also works on Linux. But really, even if your broker doesn't have a desktop client that works on Linux, pretty Pretty much every single broker, major broker, has a web client, meaning you could trade using the web client in your browser. And that's pretty much available to everybody on all operating systems. Most major brokers also have mobile apps, so you could trade on your Android phone or your iPhone, depending on which model you have, right? Uh, so trading on Linux, in most cases, you're going to be just fine as far as you know, as other software like charting platforms, the most popular charting software is TradingView. It also has native Linux support. And the next question, hey DT, you dropped your video an hour late today. What was the holdup? Well, you know what? Chances are this was not a situation where I posted my video at a different time than normal. The problem here is time zones and specifically daylight savings time because we have this weird situation. It seems like I always run into this problem. There is about a week or a two week period out of the year where, you know, we do the daylight savings time thing here in the U.S. where we move our clocks forward and back. 
but our daylight savings time, the, the dates we move things, is sometimes like a week or a two week difference for some of you folks, I think in parts of Europe that, that are doing daylight savings, but you guys change the clocks at a different time. We do it like a week or two before you guys. So when you say, you know, my video published an hour late that day, it wasn't an hour late in the US, it was an hour late for where you're at. It, it's just weird. I wish that we just got rid of daylight savings time. It's pointless. And literally, there isn't a single person on the planet that I've ever seen actually argue in favor of daylight savings time. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes moving the clock forward or backward. Nobody likes changing their sleep cycle. Nobody likes the whole hassle. You know, you, you're an hour late for work today because you forgot to change the clock. Nobody told you about it. It's just a real pain in the ass. So daylight savings time, I hate it, but that's probably what this guy was talking about because I don't remember actually posting a video at a different time than my normal time. But this question came uh, from a few weeks ago and that did coincide with when we were moving the clocks back. Moving on to the next question. And this guy seems like he's a little angry at me for some reason. I I'm not exactly sure why, but he writes, Hey DT, don't say Arch doesn't force you to use stuff because I run the base Arch with the Arch install installer. And if I select Pulse Audio for my sound choice, the installer crashes and it crashes on some effing pipe wire package. Okay, so it wasn't a question, it was just a comment. Don't say Arch doesn't force you to use stuff because I selected to use the Arch install installer and I select Pulse Audio and it crashes the installer. I'm, I, I don't, this makes no sense. So Arch didn't force you to select Pulse Audio in the Arch installer. Arch also doesn't force you to use the Arch install installer, the guided installation program, the little in curses kind of installation program. You could actually just do the standard command line Arch install. Like literally nothing he said in here was Arch forcing anything on him. I don't get it. Next up is, hey DT, I want to put my Emacs config on GitHub, but I can't figure out the right .gitignore for the Emacs config folder. I'm using Tucker for managing my dot .files. So what he's trying to do, he's trying to push his Emacs configs to GitHub. So he wants to save his Emacs dot .files. But there's certain things in Emacs, certain folders, that he doesn't want to commit to GitHub, for example, cache files and things like that. There's large amounts of data stored in the Emacs directory that he just doesn't need uh, to version control. He just wants specifically a handful of like the important config files. So he's trying to add certain directories and files to his .gitignore, but he doesn't know how. I, it's pretty straightforward, actually. All you need to do is you just list paths to files and folders in a a uh, file that you title .gitignore, right? Just make sure the paths are right and it should just work. Then you need to also, what he's probably already done, he's probably already committed all of those things that he's now trying to ignore. Well, you've got to go in and get remove uh, all those files that you've already committed that you're now trying to ignore. So you need to run the command. I think it's git rm dash dash cached space file name and by file name, the file name you're wanting to remove that you, you want to start ignoring, but you had previously committed. I hope that makes sense. Next up, hey DT, from your experience, what is the best way to learn the command line? Man or info pages or books and wikis? Well, I mean, certainly reading either man pages or wiki articles, you know, all of that stuff is great, but the best way to learn how to use the command line is to actually use the command line. You just need to open a terminal and start doing things. And uh, you can read the man page, you can read TLDR pages or ArchWiki pages about that particular thing you're doing at the command line, but you need to actually open a terminal and run through these things. Now, the more you use things like grip and set and awk and cut, you know, all, all of those standard GNU core util commands, the more you use them, the more that you learn them, the more it becomes ingrained. Like, oh, I remember how to use grip, you know, because I used it six months ago for, you know, 30 minutes or whatever, you know, just spend some time learning something for, you know, a significant amount of minutes, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, you know, really focus on learning everything about grip for, you know, just a brief little period of time. And you'd be surprised that you won't use grip for the next six weeks or even six months. But the next time you actually need to use grip, you'll remember, oh, I remember grip can 
can do this one thing with this one flag. Even if you don't quite remember what the flag is, you know it can be done. So you can quickly go search that man page and find exactly what you're looking for because you know it's in there, right? So main thing is just start using the command line. And the next comment comes from my uh, recent first look at the recent release of Elementary OS. This guy writes, hey DT, are you sure the creator allowed you to use the Elementary OS? And what he's talking about here is, I guess he's asking, does the creator of Elementary OS allow me to use their software? It's free and open source software. I, I think he's trying to start some kind of political BS here. Uh, the Elementary OS creator probably has political beliefs or something that uh, he's probably stated some controversial stuff. I don't hang out on social media, so I, I don't follow any of this stuff. And I don't really care what the Elementary OS creator, what his politics are. I don't care. I don't care what he said. What does that have to do with me, right? What does that have to do with me using a piece of software? Whoever created Elementary OS, the actual OS itself is not the creator, right? And I can separate I can separate the creator of a piece of software from the software itself, right? I'm I you guys that are so wrapped up in this political bullshit. I, you got, I, I don't understand you. I really don't understand you guys at all. And the final question on this edition of Hey DT is another one of these crazy political kind of questions. Hey DT, not many people are talking about it, but what are your thoughts on the NixOS situation? I know this topic will open up a can of worms, so you can just not answer if you don't want to, but I think bringing personal politics into Linux is just a bad idea. Okay, well, I will agree with that very last point, bringing personal Personal politics into a Linux project, free and open source software project, software project of any kind, proprietary software project even. Yeah, bringing your personal politics into any kind of group or organization is usually a very bad idea. But uh, what are my thoughts on the whole NixOS situation? I don't know. I'm not a part of their community. I like NixOS as a uh, Linux distribution. I've used it a little bit in the past. It's not my main distro that I'm running now, but even if it was, uh, again, I think this is political drama with certain people within the NixOS community. What would that have to do with me? I'm not a part of that. The only reason you guys are wrapped up in this is because you want to be wrapped up into this, right? You guys want these political arguments. You're not angry at the NixOS guys, whoever it is that are being political, or the elementary OS guys that's being political, or whoever it is, you know, because you want to jump into that fight. You're happy they said something that you disagree with because you're looking for an argument. So you want to go fight this fight. I don't want to go fight this fight. I don't care. I, I have zero cares about any, uh, I don't care what kind of left wing agenda you have, right wing agenda you have. I there, There's things maybe I agree with, maybe I don't. I don't care when it comes to software selection. I run the software that I like and that's it. When I choose a Linux distribution or a particular piece of free and open source software, if I think it's a fantastic piece of software, then it's a fantastic piece of software. I don't care about the creator's beliefs. I don't care about your beliefs, right? I, I don't care about certain free and open source software projects out there. And in some cases, they are out there doing real harm because they're too political. There's plenty of free and open source software projects out there that are destroying themselves because of all the political BS. So, but I don't care, right? They made that choice. That's their choice. If that's what they want to do, uh, ultimate freedom with free and open source software, right? You have the freedom to make whatever decision you want to make with your piece of software. And if you're the creator of a piece of software and you choose to destroy it with that political agenda of yours, so be it. You have that freedom. I respect that. I actually want freedom with my free software. That's why I'm here. I'm not looking to restrict anybody from doing what they want to do. And because I'm a fan of freedom, even if it's things I personally don't necessarily buy into, certain ideologies that I don't agree with, I still respect the fact that they have the freedom to you know, say what they want to say, right? I don't get angry ever at anyone's political beliefs or religious beliefs. And I don't care what they are. You know, they can have whatever beliefs they want to have and they can express it. I may or may not agree with it, but I will never try to say that that person doesn't have the right to express themselves. And you also have to understand, you know, as you know, you get a little older, you know, I'm in my late forties and there are 
plenty of times in my life, there have been multiple times in my life where I've changed the way I thought, right? And this is the thing. People change. People reinvent themselves. And this is a normal part of getting older. There are certain periods of life, and there's really like, I can think of two major periods in life where you will radically change your beliefs. The most obvious one, a lot of people talk about the midlife crisis that comes with people typically in their late 30s, sometimes early 40s, but really in the late 30s, early 40s, you're, about half your life has passed, you would think. You know, at least half of your lifespan is gone in most cases, and people start reevaluating that first half of their life. And typically when they start doing that self-evaluation, they realize, hey, you know what? Some of these things along the way, I would have done a lot differently. You know, choices I made in life, I would have done them totally different. And a lot of those choices I would have done differently. The, the reason I made those choices was based on political ideology or religious ideology. So I change politics or religion. So you see a lot of people radically change at that midlife crisis. There's another very important, uh, I, I guess, radical change that happens. I would say late teens, early 20s, as you really start to become an adult because really, you know, I, I know like here in the U.S., typically we tell people that they're no longer minors at the age of 18 or some states 17. You're not an adult at 18 years old. You are still a baby, right? It's not until you're like 22, 23 years old where you kind of start growing up a little bit. And typically when you get to that age, you realize how ridiculously stupid you were as a teenager. So, I mean, I, I don't want to go too long on this point, but know this, you know, whatever people say as far as their crazy uh, political beliefs or religious beliefs or whatever it happens to be, that doesn't mean they will always have those beliefs. They may change their opinion along the way. And guess what? Whatever it is that you disagree with them, you may change your opinion on those things along the way, too. And when you realize this, you stop getting angry and you stop fighting these pointless battles. Merry Christmas, guys, and Happy New Year. Peace.